Hello, and welcome to Unsolvable. In this week's episode, we will be discussing the strange disappearance of Nicholas Barclay, a teenage boy who went missing in 1994. If you're ready, let's begin. On June 13th, 1994, a Texan boy named Nicholas Barclay met with his friends in the park close to his home to play basketball. It was just before sunset that Nicholas and his friends decided to call it a day and head home. Tired from the game, Nicholas called home to ask his mother if she'll come collect him in the car. The phone was answered by Nicholas's older brother Jason. Jason explained that their mother, who worked night shift, was asleep upstairs and he refused to wake her up, telling Nicholas that he should walk home. That phone call was the last time that anyone heard from Nicholas, as he never returned home that evening. Nicholas was known to be a troublesome child. He barely attended school, and when he did, he would usually be a disruption. He was a violent child, who had on numerous occasions threatened his teachers, and even his own mother. He also had a juvenile criminal record, after breaking into a convenience store in his own town, and at the time was awaiting a sentence in hearing after being caught shoplifting a pair of trainers. While his mother, Beverly, was angry at Nicholas for staying out all night, the thought that he might be in danger had never crossed her mind, since he had done this many times in the past. Because of this, the family did not contact the police until late morning the following day. The police initially believed that Nicholas had run away from home, because he had done so in the past, although he was never gone for more than a day. On this particular occasion, Nicholas was known to only have $5 of cash on him and no spare clothes or supplies. They also believed that the upcoming sentence and hearing might have had something to do with his disappearance, since it was due to take place the day after he vanished. One of the highly possible outcomes of the hearing, had it gone ahead, would have seen Nicholas sent away from his family into a group home for troubled boys. Nicholas was strongly against this idea, which too made the notion that he ran away ever more plausible. While the police filed a missing persons report and conducted a search, they found no leads and were unable to trace Nicholas's steps the night of his disappearance. Eventually, the search ran cold. It was then, some three months later, on September 25th, that Nicholas's brother Jason called the police after seeing a young boy trying to break into the family's garage. Before anyone could get to him, the boy had fled after spotting Jason watching from the upstairs window. While he was convinced that the child was his younger brother Nicholas, the police were not. They searched the surrounding neighbourhood, but was not able to locate him. After this time, there were no more sightings or contact from Nicholas. That was until October 1997, some three years and four months after Nicholas's disappearance. In October 1997, police officials received a phone call from a man working at a youth shelter in Spain. The man explained that Nicholas arrived at the shelter after having escaped his captives and has been living there for the past couple of weeks. Immediately, the family were contacted. Nicholas's sister, Casey, caught the next flight to Spain to collect her younger brother and identify him. Casey met with the man believed to be her brother and confirmed it was him. They sat down and spoke for a little while, reminiscing about home, their family and Nicholas's childhood. However, she found it odd that his memory was a little vague, but then again, he had gone through what must have been a traumatic experience, in case he passed that off as the reason. 
Once Casey identified the man as her brother, the local authorities conducted a test to prove he was who he claimed to be. They showed him a series of family photos and quizzed him on them. The man answered 9 out of the 10 questions correct and they agreed to release him, allowing him to return home. The pair eventually boarded a flight back to the US and were greeted by the rest of the family at the airport. While this sounds like a happy ending to the story, not everything was as it seemed. While Nicholas's mother and sister believed this man was Nicholas, many other people, including his uncle, were suspicious. This Nicholas seemed particularly quiet and not at all like many remembered him. There are also several key differences between this Nicholas and the Nicholas that had disappeared more than three years ago. This man claiming to be Nicholas had dark hair and brown eyes, while Nicholas had lighter, almost blonde hair and blue eyes. This man spoke with a French accent and used phrases that were considered to be very European, to which he claimed he had picked up while being held captive initially in France. He explained that his hair and eyes were chemically changed by his captives in an attempt to conceal his true identity. To many, it was apparent that this man was not Nicholas, despite the family being adamant it was. The local authorities requested taking a blood sample and fingerprints in order to confirm his identity, but he refused to voluntarily give blood samples or his fingerprints. It didn't take long for this story to be picked up by local and national news. The profile of this story led to many private investigators looking into the case out of interest. One private investigator, who was local to the area, grew ever suspicious while working with a TV crew that had been filming the family. The investigator compared photos of Nicholas's ears and discovered that his ears did not match those from three years earlier. This information later made its way to the FBI and it was then, in February 1998, that the FBI got a court order to take the individual's fingerprints and blood to determine if they matched with Nicholas. Surprise, surprise, the fingerprints confirmed this man was not who he said he was. He wasn't Nicholas Barclay, but in fact, Frederick Pierre Bjordin a 23-year-old French serial imposter. Frederick Bjordin, also known as the Carmelian, was a serial imposter and had been charged for hundreds of accounts of false impersonation. At trial, Bjordin pleaded guilty to passport fraud and falsely impersonating Nicholas Barclay, and he was sentenced to six years in prison. This sentence was almost three times longer than what the guidelines suggested and the court explained that this was due to the harm that he had caused to the Barclay family. In 2003, Bjordin was released from prison and deported back to France. Shortly after this, he assumed the identity of Leo Bailey, a 21-year-old French man who went missing in 1996 as a teenager. Once again, DNA testing proved he wasn't who he claimed to be, and Bjordin's life went on like this for the many years that followed. While Bjordin had been identified as the man impersonating Nicholas, the mystery of Nicholas's disappearance remained unsolved. It was following the Bjordin trial that people and the authorities began questioning the Barclay family. Why did Nicholas's mother and siblings adamantly claim that Bjordin was their son and brother Nicholas, despite it clearly being a different person? And how was Bjordin so familiar with the Barclay family? He knew enough information about the family in order to pass the test administered by the Spanish authorities, which allowed him to board the flight to the US. Many believed that the Barclay family played along with the story of Bjordin being Nicholas as a way of covering up the truth. 
It is also worth noting that Building claimed during the trial that Jason knew he wasn't really Nicholas because Jason had killed his brother. He stated it was clear Jason knew what happened to Nicholas. It was also widely believed that Nicholas's sister Casey fed Building information about the family when she originally met with him in Spain. It is possible that the Barclay family saw the perfect opportunity present itself to them and Casey flew to Spain prepared, knowing that the man claiming to be Nicholas was not in fact her brother. During the police investigation of the Barclay family, they questioned Jason about his brother's disappearance. They even stated that they knew he was involved somehow. According to reports, Jason just stared at the interrogating officer without offering a defence. It was then, just a few days later, that Jason was found dead at home. The autopsy indicated that a substance overdose was the cause. Jason's death shocked many and came at a rather coincidental time. Some considered this to be an indication of his guilt. Despite the signs pointing towards a family cover-up, the authorities were never able to find any hard evidence to support the claim that the family had anything to do with Nicholas's disappearance, and the investigation was eventually dropped. Nicholas has never been found, and his disappearance remains unsolved. While official authorities continue to classify Nicholas as a runaway, many still suspect foul play. And that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Please remember to like, subscribe and share our videos. And we will be back again next Friday with another unsolvable mystery. Until then, goodbye.